Welcome to Arts and Civic Power. We are so excited to have you here. And um, together with our co-hosts, we put together this event because because we are we know that there are so many people out there who are looking for really innovative, really impactful, meaningful methods to really amplify civic engagement in US elections this year and all over the world in many cases. So um, I'm Rebecca Bray. I'm the executive director of the Center for Artistic Activism. And our wonderful co-hosts for this event are David Rockefeller Fund, Go Vote NYC, and Opportunity Fund. And I know, Lourdes, you wanted to say a couple of words. Lourdes, is the, Lourdes Rodriguez is the chief executive officer of David Rockefeller Fund. Saludos a todos y todas. Welcome, everyone. Es un verdadero placer darles la bienvenida a esta conversación acerca del poder de las artes para inspirar acción civil y movilizar el electoral. It is a pleasure to welcome you to this conversation about the power of the arts to inspire civic action and mobilize the vote. Mil gracias to the Center for Artistic Activism for their leadership and to our friends from the Opportunity Fund and Go Vote NYC for their support. Now back to you, Rebecca B. Thank you, Lourdes. Wonderful. And Neil Coleman, director of Go Vote NYC. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Go Vote NYC is delighted to co-host this, I think, very exciting and relevant conversation. Um, Go Vote NYC is a collaborative of funders that is focused on increasing democracy, civic engagement, and voter turnout in New York City through funding grantee partners that are trusted messengers in their neighborhoods. Um, so organizations that have close community connections and um, that model has shown voter turnout rates as much as doubling in communities that our grantees are engaging with. And certainly there's a close connection between ways to engage communities um, through direct conversation um, and arts and culture as a way to further mobilize and engage people. So I think today's conversation will be rel very relevant uh, for all of our work. Thank you, Neil. And Jay Goodman of the Opportunity Fund put a note in the chat if you want to take a look at that, everyone. And we are from the Center for Artistic Activism. So we are a nonprofit. We were founded in 2009. We've been able to work all over the world with thousands of people. We help advocates and change makers create impactful work through creativity and culture. We've trained over 3,000 people on developing creative campaigns, worked with hundreds of organizations through research, assessment, and cultural strategy. And uh, one of our main focuses for the past several years has been our Unstoppable Vo Voters program. Hi, I'm Rachel Gita Karp. I'm the program director of Unstoppable Voters. And with Unstoppable Voters, we focus on bringing more creativity and innovation to protecting the, the freedom to vote here in the United States in the very expansive way that that means. And we have a really quick video about some of the things that we've done. Helping to get voters motivated and to the polls is a team of unconventional people that describes themselves as artistic activists. For some Arizonans, election season has turned into a circus. The Compton Cowboys riding their way to a ballot drop box at the Compton Library. They're taking part in the National Unstoppable Voters Project. Today we're joined by Unstoppable Voters alumni and many of our friends. We are. And so we have this amazing roster of people to hear from today. And each will tell you a bit about the work that they've been part of, especially stories about how arts and creativity have been really embedded into their civic engagement work. 
They'll be sharing some key takeaways that they've learned from combining the powers of arts and civic engagement that can help guide other people, many of you out there who are doing similar work or want to. And then we'll ask some questions of them at the end as a panel. Um, feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat and we'll try, we'll all try to get to them and um, hopefully have some time at the end for that as well. And so we are starting with Erica L. Anthony, who is the co-founder and executive director of Cleveland Votes. Take it away, Erica. Awesome. Good afternoon. I'm putting my timer on because I want to make sure that I am not holding space for too long. Um, well, thank you so much uh, to the Center for Artistic Activism for hosting this webinar this afternoon. What a lit group for a Monday uh, afternoon. I need to have y'all with me every Monday. Um, so as Rebecca said, my name is Erica Anthony. I have the honor of serving as the co-founder and executive director here at Cleveland Votes in Cleveland, Ohio. Next slide, please. So who are we? Uh, we are a nearly 10 year old organization here in the city of Cleveland. We're a nonpartisan democracy building movement that works to reconstruct, excuse me, reconstruct and strengthen power through active participation of our partners. Um, in 2022, we passed our most recent uh, strategic plan. A little clip of our uh, pillars is highlighted here on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, those four pillars really ground us in our strategies, our programs, and the ways that we interact with Cleveland residents and voters um, in the region. For us, it's really important to serve as a backbone and an intermediary um, to the broader civic engagement ecosystem here in Cleveland. Um, we feel, as we've learned over the years, that there's no one sort of profile for who can be a democracy builder. Um, I will say democracy builder is a little bit of an Ohio term, but basically just means folks that are committed to affecting change in their community. Um, and so over the course of our history, we've had the great honor of working with, you know, dozens of nonprofits in the region, um, working on various issues, whether it's around education, housing, community development, voting rights at large. Um, and for us, it's really important that we provide tools and resources to make sure that they can do their jobs effectively. Um, for us, we know that we as one organization cannot serve, you know, the nearly 300,000 residents in the city of Cleveland. So it's important for us that both from a place of authenticity, um, that we empower those that already have those trusted relationships in different parts of the city, whether that's with a specific organization, a set of constituents, you know, different cultural organizations, um, and just really make sure that they have the tools they need so they can effectively activate and engage those residents. Next slide. So um, how do we sort of come to where we are today? Um, first, I just wanna give great appreciation to the team over at the Center for Artistic Activism. Uh, we sort of did the cold call thing or cold email and said, hey, we've heard about y'all. We think your work looks dope. Um, we're starting to put together a program. We'd love to talk and see if there's any sort of mutual understanding of you know, our collective goals and, and if there's a way that we can work together. And so while over the course of our time, we've done what I would say projects um, here and there with our creative partners here in the city of Cleveland, as we were going through that strategic planning process in 2022, um, we identified that this was something that we really wanted to prioritize for our organization. Like many parts of the country, uh, we're seeing a lot of disengagement from Cleveland voters um, and not for reasons that are not grounded in truth. Um, the conditions here in the city of Cleveland are, are pretty stark. Um, you know, whether we're talking about poverty, low educational attainment, lack of affordable housing, the list goes on. And so we know through research and just engaging with community members that there is a lot of dissatisfaction with our democracy at large. There is a lot of distrust with local officials, public officials, elected officials here in the city of Cleveland. And so one of our, you know, I would consider uh, core uh, ethos of Cleveland Votes is really always looking for fun and innovative ways to create um, opportunities for people to see themselves um, in this broader ecosystem. We know that elections go far beyond the actual ballot, um, the ways in which we engage, the ways in which we activate um, have to be permeated into the fabric of who we are as a community. And so as we started to conceive this concept, um, we identified that we needed to bring on some added capacity. Um, so we brought on a cultural strategist last fall, uh, Alan Gonzalez, um, and it's been such a pleasure welcoming her to the team. 
Um, and we started to think through, you know, what could this program be, not just a one-off project, but as something that could really be integrated into the fabric of our organization. And we started to have this conversation about who is an artist, who is a creative, you know, what does that mean in the context of civic engagement? And Alon conceived this title more than my art um, and the way that we started to conceive this together was really thinking about, you know, someone's discipline does not, you know, solely define who they are. If they're, uh, you know, print artist, a dancer, a poet, right? That is one dimension of who that person is and that we really wanted to see and harness this energy of like, how can we transform the power of artistic activism and expression in a way that really elevates, you know, what is happening in our community. And so you can read further here, you know, as to how this, this concept has come together. Um, we're, we're, you know, newbies, you know, little babies, you can say in the grand scheme of things compared to some of my fellow panelists here. Um, and in the next slide, we'll just show a brief um, video of, of a launch that we just did at the end of last month. So no audio, just kind of a visual representation. Um, but we decided to do this launch uh, really to introduce or reintroduce ourselves to the community, um, let them know about this initiative, get them excited about this initiative. We welcome three creatives from our community to join in a conversation, um, in a panel style conversation. Uh, this particular event was held in a arts space um, here in the city of Cleveland, um, where, you know, for context, for those that are not familiar with our city, um, central neighborhood um, is uh, where the highest population of our public housing is in the city of Cleveland. Um, when you think about some of those socioeconomic challenges that Clevelanders are facing, um, it's pretty high for the residents of the city of Cleveland in this particular neighborhood central. So it was important to us also to make sure that we were holding this launch in a part of our city um, that at times, not always, um, can be forgotten um, and, and maybe even overlooked. So it was important for us to work with Deep Roots uh, to host this event. Um, again, welcome in um, both democracy builders, creatives, artists, friends, family members um, to hear about this initiative. Um, and it was a great event. Uh, it's like one of those kind of perfect storms that where you bring in all the beautiful energy. Um, folks are really excited and, and really looking for ways how they can expand not just their knowledge, but the ways in which they activate here in the community. Next slide. Um, so just a couple of clips here uh, from the event that we held at the end of February. Um, one of the activities that we took folks through was looking at iconic campaigns, uh, political campaigns that we've seen here in the United States over the last two decades or so, um, some of which uh, many folks I'm sure on this webinar will recall the voter die campaign, uh, rock the vote, um, the very iconic President Obama hope um, image. Uh, we also showed the Magna hat, MAGA hat, excuse me. Um, and we just started to really engage in dialogue to get a sense from folks what did you feel, you know, going through those senses, you know, what did you feel? What did you hear? You know, you know, if you think about your touching and sort of how you engage with these campaigns. And it was just a great, I think, precursor to the workshops uh, that we're launching next month. Next slide. So thanks to the help of the Center for Artistic Activism, uh, we will be launching a set of workshops in April. Um, again, this is gonna be an opportunity for both creatives and democracy builders here in the city of Cleveland to come through and really start to you know, peel back the layers is the way I'm seeing it. You know, One, getting to know one another. There are not too many spaces today uh, where I think this two sets of individuals are often in the same room together. Um, so it's a relationship building opportunity. It's a space really to start to think Think about how we can leverage each other's assets. Um, I'm from the camp where, you know, of course, I can't know all the things. And so as long as I'm in relationship with those that may have a skill set in a particular area, how can we together, you know, create some dope work together? Um, so we'll do this over the course of next month. Uh, super excited. We actually just had our application close on Friday. And so we'll be informing folks in the next couple of days um, that they've been accepted into this workshop. Um, for the balance of the year, I will say uh, we're going to continue to work with the Center for Artistic Activism. Um, beyond the workshops, we also have this vision of a learning lab. Um, the learning lab will be smaller. It'll allow us to go um, in a deeper dive fashion to really think about 
a campaign that we can co-create with uh, creatives and democracy builders leading up to the, the general election in uh, fall. Um, and then we also wanna continue to cultivate relationships and do different pop-up events um, and really begin to build this community of praxis with, uh, again, the democracy builders and creatives in our community. Um, and so we're super excited, honored to be here today. Um, if anyone wants to learn more, here's our contact information. We're on all the social media channels. Follow us on the Twitter, the Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and I look forward to the rest of the dialogue today. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And next up, we'll hear from Alexis Hosey and Aisha Goss. Alexis is the Chief Campaigns Officer at the Center for Cultural Power and the Cultural Engagement Lab. Hosey is a social justice advocate with over 15 years of experience in political strategy and advocacy. And Aisha Goss joined the Center for Cultural Power in January 2022 as Chief Development and Operating Officer. And for more than 20 years, Aisha has served as a fundraising and operations professional to a variety of nonprofit organizations. I'm happy for you to take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, so great to see everyone on a Monday morning or early afternoon. Um, the Center for Cultural Power has been around in one iteration or another since 2011. We were founded in response to um, SB 1070 in Arizona, um, and we came into existence to create a container for artists to contribute to um, to the change we want to see in the world. We truly believe that culture shapes worldview and the culture is what creates the will for political and economic change. And culture moves faster than both economics and politics. And so we have been over the years really refining what it means to bring artists and community um, to the movement groups, the grassroots organizations that are really holding the change on the ground. And it's our hope that we are contributing also to um, the conversation around how to measure narrative and cultural strategy um, in real time and doing it in a way that um, helps artists better understand um, their power in the space and helps movement partners understand um, how to utilize the tools of narrative and cultural strategy effectively. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have been looking at what are the what's the pathway at cultural power. Um, next slide, please. And next um, at cultural power, we start with um, research, deep conversations with the folks on the ground that are doing the work and to really understand the needs of the community and the narratives that are true for the widest birth of people. We then take those um, narratives and turn them into a creative brief. Through the creative brief, we focus on translating the data, um, whether it's climate science or redistricting, redistricting um, or um, reproductive justice or um, migrant justice. We use like the data that is informing the policy and translate it into tools that help artists understand um, and connect it to the narratives. And then we let the artists do their thing. Um, whether it's static images, video, um, sculpture, we allow uh, our artists to take the data and the information and to really use their superpower power to create a curiosity about what's possible in a way that only artists can. And then we get the content and we test it. We test it um, with our partner, Swayable, who allows us to understand how we're reaching our target artists and audiences. And once we do that, we distribute as much as we possibly can using influencers, micro influencers, ads on YouTube, um, WhatsApp, really like going to the places where people are, where they interact, and in the languages and communities that are most comfortable to them. Next slide, please. Uh, our approach is to look at cultural and narrative strategy in two places. Cultural strategy, where it's like really the narrative change agent, whether that's the artist or culture bearer or the movement group, um, where we measure their ability to use the tools of cultural strategy to their end. 
Um, and next slide, please. And then narrative strategy. The narrative strategy, that's where we look at how what we are creating moves through the world. We're looking at the uptake, how our partners integrate our ideas, the response, how audiences respond to us, and then reach. How many people are seeing and interacting with the thing um, and how does that translate into them possibly being moved into an action? Next slide, please. Apologies for moving so fast, but you know, this is a long, a lot of um, years that we are moving into a uh, time constraint. Um, so I'm available for any follow-up questions. Um, we work with our partner Swayable um, and Swayable has a few tools that we utilize to measure audience response. We look at the specific target groups that we want to move, whether it's um, a specific race, a specific age, a specific zip code. And we really look to see, um, are we speaking to them in the words and the tools and the sounds that are comfortable and familiar to them? Um, for instance, Swayable is where we learned during one of our campaigns that in Fresno, California, they prefer Latino and, La and Latina rather than Latinx or Latin A. And so in that particular campaign where we were hoping to move people to um, mobilize around vaccinations for COVID-19, um, we found that the language that was most comfortable for our artists actually was a barrier in the communities that we wanted to reach. And so our partnership with Swayable has allowed us to make sure we are um, effectively making change without getting backlash from the communities that we hope to support. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's an example of how mobilization and persuasion are measured. Um, in this particular instance, we were working with uh, California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, where we wanted to um, create content that will help the um, community see rent control and housing stability as a form of reproductive justice. So for those that were looking at um, who interacted with our content, these are some of the questions that we were able to ask to see if we were not just um, putting forward something that they said, oh, that's cute, or um, whether we were putting out things in the world that were likely to move people into a particular action as in voting for the measure, and if we were um, helping folks really understand that reproductive justice is connected to housing stability. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. We also look at emotional response through Swayable. This tool was created just for us with all these fancy emojis. Um, and we use it, this tool to help understand like what are the emotional triggers? Is it empathy? Is it compassion? Like what are the emotions that really drive change? And we use this information, not just in our campaign structures, but also to help the artists understand um, how, how their audiences are emotionally responding to the content that they put out into the world. Um, and it's been a really effective tool for us to really understand whether um, what is the emotional response that helps to shift when people are really thinking about how um, they would like change to happen. Next slide, please. And um, that is our approach to how we measure cultural strategy and narrative strategy. And I will hand it over to Alexis to talk us through two of case studies. Yes, and please bear with me because I'm gonna be managing my own slides and talking at the same time. And you know, that's not necessarily my ministry y'all, but hi everyone. Uh, I'm Alexis Closey with the Center for Cultural Power. I'm the Chief Campaigns Officer. Um, and I do want to note, uh, just because we are in an election year, that cultural power does have two civic engagement and electoral campaigns, our movement to the ballot box campaign and our Threads of Change campaign on our C4. Um, but we chose these particular case studies um, because I think it really honors the deep partnership 
uh, that we had to build with movement groups. And I think that is a key part of the cultural strategy, cultural organizing work that we're talking about here today to move and shift campaigns. Um, so yes, uh, shout out to California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. Um, this partnership was really transformative for the organization. Um, and then Autonomy is My Joy, which is our C4 campaign, um, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, and so linking intersecting issues is a powerful organizing strategy. Um, and again, just going back to what I said, when we talk about cultural strategy in the organization, we are using that fine line of cultural strategy and cultural organizing. Um, I actually conflate them often, but they're really important to note. And they are really important because they are complementary to political campaign organizing. Um, and we're in a time where they both must exist together. Um, and so what we see sometimes is that uh, campaign organizing, political organizing can pull cultural organizing in in a very quick moment of like, okay, yes, content um, and vice versa, right? Where folks like we need the issue, um, but you really have to marry uh, these particular forms of organizing together to build effective, persuasive campaigns that move our communities. Um, and so that's what we try to do. Um, and I'll talk more about sort of what that looked like for us. It really does start with the relationships. Um, and here I am. So yes, so the California Latinas for Reproductive Justice campaign sought to create rent control and just cause controls and bell gardens. Um, and so California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, their member base um, was, uh, I'm forgetting the age range in this moment, um, but a group of Latino women in the area who were all facing eviction um, or some form of eviction or housing instability uh, based on the existing structure. Um, and they obviously did an amazing job of organizing their member base, supporting their members and understanding what was at hand. But what they really wanted to do was help people understand how housing justice was reproductive justice, right? And so some folks who are familiar with the term reproductive justice, it's very innate. We're like, yeah, of course. Um, but for other folks, people really couldn't understand the connection to why a housing issue mattered to reproductive justice or reproductive health or just reproductive freedom altogether. And it was cultural organizing, cultural strategy that really helped to further that message. Um, and so the work that we did with them very much in a supportive capacity was creating not only the content, but the capacity of their member base to really tell their story. So Aisha mentioned WhatsApp. Uh, we were training them on how to do messages on WhatsApp, how to talk to elected officials using storytelling techniques, how to videotape themselves, um, and just any sort of way that we could like support them in, in engaging civically in the process. I want to say the word lobby, but <laughs> educating um, elected officials on what was happening in their area and why the issue was important. Um, and we were successful. Um, and so I'll, Aisha mentioned our creative brief which is a narrative tool that we use, right? How do we take the data that we're getting about housing justice, the data in the area, and how do we make it palatable to artists to really visualize what we're talking about? Um, and I won't read the whole thing on the screen, but as you can see at the bottom, we ask the question, what does it look like when young parents leading supporting feminist economies of care, including health and housing? And what are the ways this allows people's reproductive and overall health to flourish? So when you ask that question and then you have like this message to the artist, like we're looking for powerful and hope, it really creates a thought process. I couldn't find any of the pieces, but again, as Aisha said, um, you are all welcome to reach out to us. Um, and I apologize to say my internet connection is unstable. So just raise a hand. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so again, this is the creative brief and this is how we engage the artists. And just going back briefly to sort of the idea of cultural organizing, it's also important to bring the artists into the issue. We meet a lot of artists who are like, we're not political beings, you know, we do this thing and it's fine, understandably so, why they may not see themselves in that space. And so true cultural strategy, cultural organizing brings the artists along and also brings the movement group or the movement people, campaign people um, along as well in understanding each side. So we really work to sort of remove the extractive relationships that can sometimes exist. So this is our impact 
Increase in power building. Majority of the artists reported increases in skills and confidence. That's major for us. And it was really significant. Um, and there's this shift because at some point, uh, the member base of the California Latinas of Reproductive Justice became artists in their own way, right? And they also named just an increase in confidence and increase in skills. Um, of course, we love to talk about our reach. Um, so three of the four stories reached a large audience on cultural power social media. And this is going back to swayable data, a 0.4 and 0.5 increase in intent to take action and support for tenant protections in California audiences. And this is where Aisha um, and her team in learning and impact really, really live for the good data. Um, and this is success. In August 2022, uh, the legislation passed um, and the Bell Gardens, I uh, believe city council, please don't quote me on that. Uh, but again, this was successful and it was a great blending of campaign organizing, cultural strategy, capacity building um, that really saw that success and that victory. And California Latinas Reproductive Justice is still one of our favorite partners. So what did we learn? We learned that linking intersecting issues was critical. Um, and so we do that still to this day, like that is our model. We work with movement groups across many issues and help folks to understand how climate justice is gender justice, how migrant justice is gender justice and vice versa. Um, and all the issues intersecting housing instability, hunger, um, how they all link and how they can be told in a beautiful story. And we create that create and brief we find that data and we we support the artists and really sort of visualizing it in that way. Voices of community members are very persuasive. We're all civic engagement folks here. So I trust that everyone understands why. Um, back when I used to lobby in New York State, our campaign strategy was to find all the members, find all the people who lived in that elected official state and bring them and really support them. And so obviously it's persuasive. It's what people want to hear. Um, and deep partnerships with movement groups are key. Uh, yeah, just for us as an organization and even in bringing the artists along. Like now, so many of the movement groups that we've worked with have sort of created their own cultural strategy section and we love that. Um, we love to support that work, be that intermediary, but also sort of move out of that relationship and allow for the artists and the movement groups to just excel and flourish together. Um, and I'll start this, hopefully the sound works. If it doesn't, it's okay. Um, this is Autonomy is My Joy. And so we grew from the work that we did um, with California Latinas Reproductive Justice. We were so excited about what we saw, the understanding of linking intersecting issues. And we were like, we wanna go harder. <laughs> and luckily when you have a C4, you can do those kind of things. So we decided that we wanted to talk about abortion. We wanted to talk about black maternal health. We wanted to talk about all the issues. Um, and we tried to figure out what was the frame that would allow us to be able to encompass all the things that were happening or that do happen around reproductive justice, but housing, mental health, um, and so we reached out to tons of partners and I'm talking about really relying on our own personal relationships. Like I'm calling my friend who's a birth worker, like, girl, I need to talk to you about this thing. Who do you know? And really bringing that in, going back to the relationship building piece of it. Um, we testify, um, I'm, I'm blanking, Moms Rising, of course, they were a huge partner to us in this. Um, Shawnee Benton from um, the film Aftershock. We really co like correlated a big group of partners and we just sat in and dug in around the narratives um, and came up with Autonomy is My Joy. And um, hopefully this sounds- As a wife and mother, I look at my children and feel overwhelming pride. But I also have birthing trauma. During my first two pregnancies, I dealt with providers who pressured me into compliance. I walked away disappointed by the medical interventions I was backed into. When I became pregnant again, I was armed with evidence-based information and a doula committed to advocating for both me and my baby. Making decisions that I felt great about allowed me to be in the driver's seat of my care. America can be a place where every Black mother has access to quality care and agency. With legislation like the Momnibus Act, we can collectively invest in community-based solutions.
autonomy is my joy. Yes. And there are more videos online if folks are interested. And I will leave us here with this quote, um, which is from one of our artists and filmmakers that we worked with. Um, but again, this is the plug around cultural strategy, cultural organizing, and making those connections. And thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Amazing resources from both of you. And thank you so much for sharing. In the chat, everyone is an incredible um, case study and guide from Center for Cultural Power. And there's so much more good stuff on the website. Um, clearly, a lot of amazing work has been done. So thank you both. So next, we want to um, hear from Fair Count and Cool, Cool, Cool Production. So Rebecca DeHart is the CEO of Fair Count, and Mark Kendall and Bill Worley are co-founders of Cool, Cool, Cool Production. So Rebecca, please. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm going to keep it very brief so we can get to all the great content that was created by Cool, Cool, Cool. But I'm Rebecca DeHart. I work at Fair Count. Fair Count was founded by Stacey Abrams in 2019 um, to try and get a fair and accurate count in the, in the decennial census. So we work in the census and in between censuses, we also work in the other pillars of democracy, voting and redistricting to try and get more people engaged, particularly to really hone in on historically undercounted communities same communities that are often more likely to face voter suppression and other tactics, and really try and, and elevate the voices in um, those three most important pillars of democracy. And so when it came time for redistricting, we're like, wow, redistricting, you know, it's not the most enticing, inviting pillar of democracy to participate in. And so we called our friends at Cool, Cool, Cool Productions to talk about how we could use humor and art in a way that would really tap into communities that otherwise might not feel a part of the redistricting conversation. So I'll turn it over to Bill and Mark to talk a little more. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, y'all. I'm Bill Worley. I'm co-founder of Cool, Cool, Cool Productions. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, we're excited to be here, excited to be on this call. And we're based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and we create content that encourages civic engagement and can community building. And really what makes us different than a lot of folks is we use comedy to broach complicated, dense, difficult topic it's topics like redistricting. Uh, so why do we use comedy? Comedy is a great vehicle to give someone new information for the first time. They're more likely to be open to something new when they're laughing. And I think we can all think of our favorite stand-up or comedy piece that really might have changed our perspective on something. And we found that not only is comedy beneficial, but using positive comedy that elicits emotions like joy and inspiration can actually really motivate people to take action. Heck yes, Bill. I agree. Uh, hey, all. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm the other co-founder of Cool, Cool, Cool Productions. And, you know, Bill, you've been talking about this comedy. I think that's great. So that makes me think we should probably show uh, one of our video collaborations with Fair Count. So a couple years ago, Fair Count, uh, they talked about collaborating, talking about redistricting, as Rebecca mentioned. And so, you know, we wanted to create a video that would encourage folks to get involved in the process. And we wanted to speak specifically to folks in Atlanta, people to Georgia, uh, using comedy. So uh, what you're about to see is a Bob Ross parody. So we'll check that out. <laughs> well, I still got Georgia on the mind. So let's get back to seeing what we can do with fair districts. And add a little nice happy blue there. Ain't that nice? Oh, there's a couple little dirty birds there. They're gonna become lemon pepper wings a little later. Gonna flick a little extra seasoning on it. Gonna put some bass right here and oh, we got some potholes. You know what? I'm just gonna fill those up with some peaches. There, problem solved. There's still gonna be traffic on 75-85 though. Uh-oh. Looks like we got some gerrymandering going on. Now, when lawmakers draw lines through communities of interest during redistricting, it dilutes the power of those communities. So we're just not gonna let that happen. See, much better. We just turned that into a school with better funding. And pandemic relief. <laughs> Whoops, how Gucci Mane get there? The East Atlanta Santa. You know what? It doesn't matter. Guwap stays. Gucci. Redistricting is a people power process and getting fair districts is gonna need you. So when we use our voices, every community in Georgia can be the happy place 
we deserve. Visit faircount.org for more. And join us next week as we paint outcasts on the front of Stone Mountain. All right, great. So uh, that's that's the example. And we had so much fun making that. All I can say is like, damn, that was really good. So a couple quick things we want to point out, uh, you know, that we were looking to do in that piece. You know, we were focusing on references specific to Atlanta and specific to Georgia in a way that felt authentic to both uh, you know, Bill as Southerners and to Fair Count as well. And, you know, we were trying to envision a world that we wanted to see, you know, so instead of having Confederate soldiers on the front of Stone Mountain, we want to see outcasts on the, on the front of it. Instead of having potholes and all that kind of stuff, where they were filled with gigantic beaches. Uh, and I saw in the chat, people were mentioning Gucci Mane. Uh, we got him to voice that character. That cost a lot of money. And that's where most of the budget went uh, for the video. Uh, but, uh, but at the end of the day, what we really were trying to focus on was making sure that the viewer felt empowered, like making this, you know, vision of Georgia that we're talking about, they we wanted to make them feel like, hey, I can participate in this process. I feel empowered to get involved. Uh, so in short, uh, we were looking to highlight joy. Yeah, and, and we have one more example, Mark, of highlighting that joy in just a different way. It's from the same campaign. I think we have time to show it. Um, but this also talks about redistricting without depressing the audience and trying to approach it from a more fun, engaging angle. Okay, class, it's redistricting day, and Kevin has drawn the lines. So now we're going to vote for class president. Everyone for Jessica? <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay. Uh, everyone for Kevin? Okay, so that's two districts for Kevin, one for Jessica. Kevin wins. Wait, that's not fair. When politicians draw the lines, they can divide us to maintain their own power. I'm a bad boy. So to fight for fair districts, visit faircount.org. Yeah, there's another good one, Mark. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, and so similar to the first one, you know, uh, we wanted it to feel uh, honest to us as it, it being in Atlanta, being in the South. So it's like the crew was uh, from Atlanta. All the actors were like local Atlanta actors as well. And another thing that we want to put, point out about both of these videos was just how uh, great of a coll collaborator Fair Count was. You know, so it's just like they came in, they knew they wanted something that what that used comedy in some way. And because they came in with such uh, great uh, facts, research and expertise that helped us, you know, use the comedy to make, you know, the messages as clear uh, and as and as informative uh, as possible. So it was uh, really getting a great getting a chance to work with them. And uh, and I'll drop our like info if you want to see other videos from us and things like that i'll drop our uh, info in the chat uh as well but i think that's all we got thank you so much um and we have one last incredible speaker margaret faliano uh hold on let me bring up her lovely picture uh there we go. Margaret is a citizen of the Chippewa Cree tribe and is currently a campaign manager at Illuminative. Uh, Illuminative is a native women-led nonprofit that builds power for Indian country by uplifting native stories, voices, and issues on a national scale. Take it away, Margaret. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen right here. Wonderful, you should all be seeing that. Hello, Tanse, everyone. My name is Margaret Faliano. Um, I'm currently calling from the uh, Lenape, uh, the traditional homelands of the Lenape peoples in New York City. And I work for Illuminative, as was mentioned, a native woman-led nonprofit focused on amplifying contemporary native voices, stories, and issues on a national scale, mainly in the sectors of media, pop culture, politics. And to talk about our work and really to talk about how we engage with artists would be irrelevant without talking about why Illuminative exists. And that is because we were founded on research. In 2018, our seminal research project was founded on countless comprehensive literature reviews, focus groups across 10 states, message, tested, message testing, and 
really we found a glaring truth that native people face the greatest threat today of invisibility. And we found this because we examined dominant narratives across American society about native peoples, asking where these narratives originate and really how they impact public perceptions, opinions, attitudes, and behaviors of non-native peoples. Now, this threat is institutionalized erasure against native peoples. And this shows up everywhere because in total, if you do not see, hear, or read about native peoples, we simply do not exist. Our research found that 78% of Americans polled know little to nothing about native peoples. And that a lot of us, a lot of Americans think that we are a dwindling population as well. 27 states make no mention of a single native American in K through 12 curriculum, more than half. And 87% of state history standards don't mention any native person past the year 1900 or any contemporary way. So we're not showing up in K through 12 education. We, then we look at media. Native American characters make up between zero to 0.04% 0 of all characters in primetime TV and films. And then you go back to the internet and when you search Native American, our research showed that 95% of the first 100 Google images were before the 19th century. So again, we are not showing up in any kind of way. Uh, you do not see, hear, or read about us. And this void is filled with inaccurate stereotypes, myths, inaccurate portrayals of our people that appear in TV and film, like old Western cowboys versus Indians type of movies, or in racist team names and sports mascots or in Halloween costumes. But in this void and with our work, we found opportunity because our research also showed that 78% of Americans, when presented with an accurate narrative about Native peoples and that we are alive, thriving, brilliant culture builders and contributors to this country, 78% of Americans wanted to know more about us. And they also believed that it was important to hear Native-led stories. So in our work, we deal with narratives a lot. And I know that's been something that has been brought up several times. So I just wanna ground us a little bit in it. Narratives are the broadly accepted stories that reinforce ideas, norms, issues, or expectations in societies. And they are created by stories, really, passed along between family members, by the news and media, by entertainment and pop culture, education and art, policies, and more. Narratives can reinforce stereotypes and allow the status quo and oppressive systems to stay in place. But narratives are also the key to building power for Native peoples and other people of color. Narratives offer an opportunity for us to understand systems. And as was mentioned earlier, for instance, Black Lives Matter is a movement and a narrative frame that allowed millions of people to understand systemic racism and anti-Blackness, perhaps for the first time. Another narrative frame that really built power for Native peoples was the No, D no Dakota Access Pipeline or the Water is Life movement. That was a movement where people realized like, Native peoples are fighting for issues that are central to all living beings. We fight for water, for the rights of land and to return to land and steward that land. And we also focus on narratives in terms of language. What comes to mind when you think of protester versus protector? So narrative strategy is all about the work that we do. And narrative strategy, strategy in itself is the practice of sharing these connected stories and messages to create, spread, or reinforce positive narratives and counter harmful ones. Narrative strategy and the work that we do is made up of many stories and many participants in those stories, which include our artists and culture bearers. The narrative strategy is the glue that holds all of Illuminative's work together. And I'm sure all of your work together as well from organizing, advocacy, culture, to communications. Narrative and how we can tap into narrative and change that is used as a vessel for our work. So narrative strategy and creatives as our culture bearers truly go hand in hand. So in our work, we really found ourselves on the idea that culture is the agent of change and the object of change. Because culture is the beliefs, values, customs, and norms of the people. And it's also the, the people that make up that culture. It's the creatives, the art, 
the arts, like what you see in pop culture and media, anything that can really contain, express or transmit ideas. Now creatives are who we work with and tap into to move culture. They are the culture changers, the culture bearers. They are those that you see and that you think about when any kind of topic really, um, from music to visual arts and theater to actors and actresses, your favorite documentaries and who's producing them. They, creatives are those that allow ideas to be transmitted into stories to then be received and allow people to understand, say, a narrative. And this all goes into what we call a, the heart game, truly, in our work. And this is all about cultural organizing. Cultural organizing and narrative change and working with creatives ties all of our work together. And cultural organizing and tapping into those people are those artists, athletes. They don't just have to be like a painter or an actor. They can be your grassroots activists. They can be um, your fandom page that you go to on like Reddit or something. Now the power of creatives is what we mainly tap into in our work to make and break our research into new avenues. We've used creatives every step of the way from talking about uh, body sovereignty to getting Secretary of Interior Deb Holland nominated and elected um, as a part of Joe Biden's administration campaign in 2020. And creatives can really look like anything, like I said, from artists to uh, actors and actresses that you see in the film. And so what I really want to talk about uh, to deep dive into just one piece of our work that we've tapped into creatives is getting Secretary, Secretary of Interior Deb Holland confirmed and nominated for um, in 2020. To set the background a little bit, the year was 2020, obviously. And um, at the time, Representative Holland of New Mexico, she didn't have a name to the rest of the country outside of Native American peoples. And we were fighting a really large narrative because even though we wanted her, the main, the main pushback was that she was inexperienced or too radical or supported the environment too much to lead the, uh, the Department of Interior. So what we had to do to change this through narrative strategy was we activated air game, ground game, inside game, and heart game. So air game, going from top down, lots of communications involved commissioning and distributing a ton of artwork, graphic design shared on social media, activating certain hashtags like hashtag dev for interior. And that all involved artist commissions. Because again, as our culture bearers, they were able to take an idea and concept put their own story and twist to it and allow it to be received in a way that boom, that far image on the right confirmed Deb Holland, Secretary of Interior. All of those pieces are native made and created. And the photo in the middle on the bottom, that was a projection that we did onto the Department of Interior building. And though it was definitely uh, guerrilla marketing and was not allowed, <laughs> it was something that caused people to pause and take in an idea and to know like who Deb Holland is and why she is in fact the most qualified person to lead the Department of Interior. And then lastly, again, tapping into that heart game and those other forms of culture bearers and culture creators, we called on 100 women in Hollywood to um, write in and confirm that they were supporting Deb Holland for the Secretary of Interior and to push the Biden administration to confirm and nominate her. But Deb Holland aside, we use creatives in so many different ways. Creatives, as was mentioned before, we give them a creative brief to really make sure that we are aligned in our values, aligned in what a campaign is about. And these three pieces specifically were for our equity fund work, which was truly around uh, climate change, voter engagement, and voter education. Now, these three pieces were really the interpretations of the artists because artists are the experts in this field. And because we engage and activate them so much, we have to create these reciprocal relationships and innate trust so that they know that they have the freedom to pour their own heart and culture into each of these pieces in which each of these pieces that you see here are based off of specifically the, the tribal, the, the tribal and cultural, um, practices of those people like Mar Austin. Mar 
Sorry, Margaret, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we actually can't see your slides. And so it sounds like you're showing amazing images, but we we just see the slide that says we are illuminative. No, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's oh. okay. I mean, the way you described them was so beautiful. I think everyone would love to see them. Um, we also could share them after the fact. Um, and so everyone can look back and, and see them if that's okay with you. Okay, yes, I can do that. Okay, wonderful. Well, that that was just about everything that I was going to touch on because I know we're running a little bit short on time. But my point in that was working with artists in this field and to engage them as our culture bearers, they have to be treated as if they, they are the experts in the field and they have to have trust and the creative freedom to put their own values in align with ours to activate the campaigns that you truly want to make a change. So our work constantly is with creatives and artists and they allow us to really transmit our messages and foundationalize our campaigns for years and years to come. So thank you, thank you. so much, Margaret. And um, so sorry about the slides and we will share those afterwards because I think those are amazing images. I wonder, we only have a few minutes for a group discussion and I just really wanted to ask one critical question in terms of a takeaway for everyone, which is, you know, are there tools, methods, processes, ways of thinking that you think are the some of the most important things to make collaborative journeys between arts and advocacy work really well? Margaret, do you, sorry, if, and I know you even just said at the end of some of the things that you think are really critical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, critical to work with artists is again, like I said before, to treat them like they are the experts in the field, to give them creative freedom and to not just come up to them uh, like in a transactional process, process like, hey, this is what we need and this is all that we want, go. Because artists need to be able to tie in their own beliefs, ideas, stories um, to really bring to life a project or a campaign. And so a creative brief is like a brief one pager that just says like top line, these are the goals of the initiative. This is uh, the dates and deadlines. Um, it also establishes uh, like commission rates and stuff like that because artists absolutely deserve to be paid. We do not believe in any kind of uh, free labor for this work because even the process of creation in itself is emotionally laborious. And so as long as you give them the opportunity to lean in to their own expertise to help inform the, the project or the creative piece, and you maintain that relationship with them for a long time um, so that you can keep coming back to each other and build that relationship for future commissions. That's something right. that they would be most important. I love that sustainable over time seems really important. And Erica, you have your hand up. Uh, just briefly, one follow all the people on this screen. Like that's that's your first assignment. Um, secondly, I would say relinquish any sort of barriers or um, scaffolding around what's possible. I think that is what I have learned over the years engaging with our creative community. You know, I tend to be the nerdy like policy person, numbers, charts, and there's that serves a role, right? Um, but I think just really being open, um, as Margaret was just saying, like allowing that creative expression to manifest in a way that makes sense for the community, the project, the campaign, whatever it may be, um, I think is really, really important because I think that authenticity is going to come through in ways, you know, far beyond maybe what we can even think about and or conceive like a Bob Ross video that is like <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just relinquish any sort of barriers or limitations for what's possible and just really lean into that imag imaginative state. Wonderful. Thank you. And Alexis, did you have your hand up? Did you want to add? Um, yes, but uh, Mar Margaret said it beautifully. Uh, you know, the creative brief model, the relationship building is uh, critical. It's something cultural power is really proud to see sort of expanding across the field. And so, um, yeah, just creative briefing, data, 
really so so I'm someone who also loves a good campaign policy nerdy sort of space and I think the blending of that is the data is the research and then sort of that interpretation of it and a creative brief that really allows the artist to just like jump in and do their thing so wonderful and we are at time and and we know that many people have to go and I do want to just thank all of you. I'm so glad that we had a chance to hear from all of you and see some of your wonderful work. I encourage yes, everyone should follow all of the wonderful people on the screen and um, look further at obviously we've just looked at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the wonderful things that are happening. Um, we do, you know, we will send out an email afterwards with follow ups ways to get in touch with these folks. Um, some slides to share and some resources. And, you know, I wonder if any of you also have resources that you think anybody in the audience are important to support arts and civic power, please share. We know, for example, we have a toolkit that we've developed, which is all about creating um, creative campaigns. And it's a step by step kind of guide that advocacy groups and others can use with a lot of exercises honed over many years. Also at the Center for Artistic Activism, we have creative consulting happy hours, which are a free way that somebody lurking on a campaign could get in touch with us and get mentoring and support on any project that you're working on. Um, some things from others. So the Center for Cultural Power has, of course, incredible work, and they have a number of reports on their website, which I would definitely encourage you to look at. I would love to. Sorry? Oh, we'll share it out in the wrap up email. As gonna, well. Great, yes. And um, also, just to let people know that Race Forward has, um, and the Americans for the Arts have announced a new initiative called the Cultural Week of Action on Race and Democracy, and they're accepting applications for funding to support organizations looking to deepen commitments to racial justice and inclusive democracy through cultural activities this year. Um, another one is a brand new guide from Forward Together that you see here, which I think could be an interesting resource for many of you. And we also have a number of exciting opportunities coming up, including potential funding and other opportunities for advocacy groups, artists, and others. So join our newsletter at c4a.org slash newsletter if you want to make sure that you're informed about all of that stuff. And um, I think that is it. I just thank all of you for coming. And I'm sorry that we went over for a few minutes, but <laughs> so, amazing, amazing content. So. Thank you. Feel free to reach out. Um, and again, we'll send you all of these things in a couple of days so that you can uh, keep keep all the work going, keep all the creativity going. Yes. Thanks. Thank you all for joining. Bye.